else, actually, in the lead up to it. It was sort of quite statesmanlike and serious, and it didn't have any jokes in it. I then distributed a copy of the speech to all my directors, saying that I was being asked to do this and that what's their view. Anyway, one of the directors, he said, well, it needs some jokes. <laughs> I said, well, it's a quite a serious affair. I don't know whether... He says, yes, but, you know, people like you for your jokes, you know, they find you've got to throw in one or two jokes. It's too straight-laced. I said, well, the joke that always goes down well is the crap one. From what I understand, every stand-up comedian lives in terror. Will somebody find me funny? Now, if a comedian has that terror about his material, I encourage business leaders not to follow the jokey line. I did feel that it might possibly be slightly risque. I did mention that, but I don't think I was listened to very clearly. As he arrived at the Albert Hall, Gerald Ratner was at the top of his game. A global empire to his name, a millionaire many times over. And now he had the chance to win recognition and respect. It was quite a, an ordeal for me, but I felt that if I wanted to achieve whatever fame or glory that you want at that age, I had to do something like this. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. President, for asking me to address such a prestigious audience. But the audience wasn't just made up of Britain's business elite. Listening keenly was journalist Harry Arnold. I was leaked a copy of his speech before it was delivered. I was amazed at the content. I couldn't really believe he was going to deliver it. Uh, and, of course, I had to make sure that he spoke the precise words that were on the paper. I got to the joke bit. The speech was going extremely well. All my nerves had disappeared. We even sell a pair of earrings for under a pound. Gold earrings as well. And some people say, well, that's cheaper than a prawn sandwich from Marks and Spencers. But I have to say, the sandwich will probably last longer than the earrings. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like waiting for a murderer to be sentenced. And you think you know what he's going to be sent down for, but then you think, well, will he, won't he? We also do this uh, nice sherry decanter. It's cut glass, and it comes complete with six glasses on a silver-plated tray that your butler could uh, bring you in and serve you drinks on. And it's really only cost £4.95. pence. <laughs> People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say, because it's total crap. Um, I thought, yes, yes, we've got you. Because I knew it was a front-page story. And that's what journalists live for, front-page stories. We call it the splash, and he certainly made a splash. If I could turn back time... I was devastated. If I could find a way... It was horrendous. I'd take back those words. I thought, I've never had this before. It was something that we had never expected, ever. I was in Maidstone, and our store is directly opposite a local branch of WH Smith's. And all I could see in WH Smith's window were the red tops um, publicising crap on Gerald's face. And um, it was devastating. He did what every business person dreads, which is something coming out of your mouth that absolutely takes the stuffing out of your core asset, which is your brand. I went on the Terry Wogan show to explain and apologise. Look at that now. What, how would you describe that? Total crap? <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe any of the products that we sell as crap or total crap. Yes, you did. 
But basically, all that did was proliferate it even more because a lot of people that were watching Morgan didn't even know about the story. So that was a mistake. And it went from bad to worse. It was just too good a story for the media to let go. It became locked in the public consciousness. It didn't just damage his personal reputation. It had an immediate and devastating effect on the high street. Customers were just offended by the remark because it questioned their decision to buy a product from a Ratner store. The jewellery chain Ratner's is closing 180 of its British stores. In one store, we had more refunds than sales on one particular day. Ratner's is to close a further 54 shops with a loss of 150 jobs. Gerald Ratner spent 18 months fighting to turn his business round. The city pressured him to take on a chairman who decided the only way to save the Ratner group was to get rid of Ratner. He called me in and uh, he said that uh, I should go. I didn't see that coming at all. It was a bolt out of the blue. And um, he let me keep my car, although I had two or three. He let me keep one of the cars and... Uh, of course, I didn't have my driver to drive me back home, and I drove myself, and, uh, and I actually, what was actually quite pathetic is I ran out of petrol, went to the petrol station, and I hadn't filled up myself in a petrol station, because you're closeted in this situation for 10 years with, with all these people, and I didn't even know how to fill up the bloody car. So, you know, at that point, I sort of broke down to a certain degree, and um, it took me about seven years to get back on my feet. Joel Ratner's resignation from the jewellery chain which bears his name marks the end of an era. It does seem incredible that a commercial hotshot could have made such a basic error. But Gerald Ratner had written his speech for the amusement of a select group of business leaders. He'd not considered how it might be interpreted by a far more important audience, his customers. I think he made the same mistake as many, many ordinary people, some famous people, who think they're having a private conversation or a conversation with 10, 20, 30 people and don't realise that it will reverberate, first of all, around the country and then around the world. And then, of course, the power of the press kicks in. He never understood that at all. Amazingly, Ratner had made the jokes before and they'd even been published. But like all good punchlines, it was a question of timing. Why they were saying that this was all good fun in the late 80s, but then it was so horrific in uh, the 90s, I don't know, other than perhaps it was a time of recession and uh, people lost their sense of humour, I guess. Ratner's biggest mistake was not respecting his audience. Pure arrogance and disconnect. And if you lose the understanding of the people who you know, put their hand in their pocket and, and pull out their credit card and whatever to buy something, you've lost the game. It would be easy to think that Mr Ratner just suffered from an unfortunate bout of honesty. But that's not quite how I see it. I think he was plainly wrong. His products weren't C-R-A-P at all. You see, the value of those kinds of objects, it doesn't come from the physical form or from the manufacturing cost. It's in the value that people attach to them. And people were evidently very happy to buy them. Until Mr Ratner opened his mouth. But Gerald Ratner is not alone in being too candid for the good of his brand. Clothes for hooligans. Not the words of a fashion critic, but those of the boss of Top Man about his own designs. An outspoken magazine interview left director of Top Man, David Shepard, in hot water... And many were surprised by the Barclay Card chief executive who admitted... I don't borrow on credit. That's too expensive. Tellingly, both these gaffes were described by a new phrase that had entered the language, doing a Ratner. Ratner eventually managed to get some good publicity. His notoriety helped him launch a new jewellery store with a new name, Gerald Online. When a company has a problem with a product, the way it responds can become even more important for its reputation than the problem itself. And not all companies get this right, even one as savvy as Apple. 
Apple is usually a company with faultless marketing. So it was really surprising to see us allow a small defect in the iPhone turn into a major PR disaster. Over the years, Apple has grown into a corporation worth hundreds of billions of dollars, thanks to its genius for knowing exactly what its customers want and delivering hit product after hit product. The very important thing to remember about Apple is that people love Apple. They are in love with this brand. And as you know, in love, people can act very irrationally. And in recent years, it's Apple's iPhone that's attracted most devotees. It revolutionised the smartphone industry and came to account for nearly half of all Apple's revenue. So when the new iPhone 4 was unveiled last summer, the adoring public quickly fell for its charms. The iPhone 4 launch was absolute pandemonium. People were queuing through the night for days and days and days before this thing went on sale. 1.7 million of these things walking out of stores over the opening weekend alone. This is like a Hollywood movie blockbuster. What they count on is having the early adopters, the people who stand in line, who get their product to gush about. What's particularly interesting about Justin is that he's out here six days in advance of the launch of the phone. So tell me, is it worth it? Uh, to me, it is. Apple's I mean, customers were happy to buy on the strength of the name alone. Blind faith. No, but just, I always find it extraordinary that people, literally like £500 for an iPhone, and people who've ne never touched it. I'm going to now unbox iPhone 4. It'd be like buying a car without test driving it, but they do that all the time. It's a white one! After the initial thrill of holding their precious iPhone 4s, it didn't take long for some Apple fans to discover there was a problem. About three or four days later, word started coming back in that there were some reception issues. The reception goes, you hold it. I mean, what my other phone I've got, my, it's five bars 3G, and this one is just fading in reception. It shouldn't be like that at all. The antenna wasn't actually up to scratch, and also calls were being dropped, signals were being lost. Some users have found that if they grip their phones like this, then reception starts to melt away. Disappointingly, when customers complained to Apple, they were met with, effectively, a wall of silence. Apple kind of went into denial mode. They basically said that there wasn't an issue and tried to downplay the problems. It's difficult for a company that gets complaints like these. Yes, it can admit there's a serious fault, but it would be annoying to do that, wouldn't it, if it didn't turn out to be that serious after all? The alternative is just to hope the problem goes away. There is one more risky option, though. You can try to make it go away by shifting the blame onto the customer. They told the first person that they responded to, hold it a different way. OK, there's only one or two ways you can hold a phone uh, with one hand or the other hand. You can't tell somebody that that's a solution. It's really, really dismissive when a company actually makes a, a complex product and then blames its users, the people who have stepped up and paid it loads of money to buy it, for basically being the cause of the problem. iPhone 4 did one thing very well, and that was for the first time we exposed the arrogance of Apple. Apple actually is quite an arrogant brand. They are the best, and they feel they are the best, and they produced the best. So therefore, it couldn't go wrong. It seemed Apple's policy of denial wasn't working. The early feedback with Apple saying it's not our fault turned into what was a PR nightmare for Apple. It was all over the internet, and this built really, really quickly. I hate my iPhone 4. Well, it turns out the iPhone 4 has a little bit of a problem. Now, instead of you having to change the way you hold a phone, you can hold the phone in the regular, comfortable way. From YouTube videos showing the problems to blogs reporting a diary of dropped calls and lowering antenna bars. I've got full bars, no matter where I hold it, because I've got a latex glove on. This was on morning television. It was on nightly news. The technical problems that plagued the Apple iPhone 4. It was a snowball effect, and everybody felt they had something to say. When you dip it with the death grip, then your call slips away. And they had to address it. Great. Well, let me get started. 
With speculation about recalls all over the traditional media and PR's new battleground, the internet, Apple's boss Steve Jobs